This episode is brought to you by the Council for Exceptional Children, the largest international professional organization dedicated to high-quality education that is inclusive and equitable for individuals with disabilities and or gifts and talents. Learn more at exceptionalchildren.org. ADHD has always been classified as some sort of disorder of the will. Yeah. That you're just not trying hard enough. A moral failing. Yeah, yeah. And that's insane. The perception of autism is evolving from a disorder to a distinct neurotype and even a unique culture. But what does it mean to view autism through the lens of culture? How does this perspective influence the way we approach autism evaluations, ensuring they're affirming rather than pathologizing? Today, we're talking to Matt Lowry, a licensed psychological practitioner specializing in neurodiversity affirming evaluations and therapy for autistic clients. Matt, who is an autistic adult and host of the Autistic Culture podcast, will also share how he feels embracing an autistic identity can transform lives. That's straight ahead on episode 213. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. For those of you who are educators out there and looking for ways to support your neurodivergent students, be sure to check out our offerings at the Neurodiversity University Learning Platform. If you're looking for ways to support twice exceptional students, we have modules for supporting 2E kids with learning disabilities, neurodevelopmental diagnoses, or mental health needs. Or if you're looking for information about supporting learners in any environment dealing with dyslexia, definitely check out our Foundations of Dyslexia for Educators course. These are available for individuals to step up their teaching strategies. Or if you're an administrator who wants to bring these courses to your teachers, we can help with that too. Check out everything at neurodiversity.university and send us an email through the contact page if there's any way we can help. All right, my talk with Matt Lowry is up next. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast, we describe these autistic behaviors from the outside. What we see these kids doing when they struggle, and we describe that as the definition of autism that there's these deficits in social ability because we want them to be more social. And there's these deficits in their restrictive repetitive behaviors because we want them to be more flexible. And uh, these are grievances. It's not what autism feels like on the inside. And this is also true in the anxiety community. You're avoiding this. We need you to go to school. We need you to eat these foods because it's difficult on a caregiver or it's difficult on the support people. And, And that can be a big motivation for people to want to change But we want people who are entering into therapy to think about what their own goals are and not just be responding to the grievances of their community. That's episode 199. Find it wherever you get your podcast. I'm excited to talk to Matt Lowry today. Matt is a licensed psychological practitioner who practices neurodiversity affirming evaluations and therapy for autistic clients at his practice in Kentucky. He's also the host of the Autistic Culture Podcast and is an autistic adult and parent to an autistic son. So Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I want to start off with a question that I think is pretty broad, but will also help our audience to understand both you and the way you conceptualize autism and neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. So like many people in the neurodiversity community, you advocate for moving away from seeing autism as a disorder and instead as a neurotype, but also, and this is the one that I think some people may not have considered, as a culture. Yes. Can you share a little bit about this framework and how you really came to understand autism in this way? So we did an episode about autism as a culture because there there is like, Seven defining characteristics that make up a culture, and I can't remember them for the life of me. But uh, if anyone is interested in those seven uh, areas, we've got a whole episode about it. But my personal experience is that, number one, a lot of my mom's family is autistic. Uh, I am autistic. My son is autistic. And uh, as of May, the research shows that the heritability rate of autism is 94%. 
So my personal account for this is that uh, not only is it genetic, not only do we inherit the, the, the genes that cause us to have the hyperconnected brains, but we also are raised by autistic people. And in doing that, uh, for instance, like, you know, behind me in my room, uh, this is my office slash museum. I used to have all my degrees behind me, but no one cared about the degrees. Everyone wanted to see Pikachu. So I rearranged my office to be a museum. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've got like my lightsabers and my Hylian shield and my Mando helmet. And these are all the things that I value. And I raise my son in that culture. So when we raise children with, uh, when autistic parents raise autistic children, assuming there's not a lot of internalized ableism there, because boy, that's a whole other thing. Right. We impart upon them ways to interact with the world, ways to find other people. We impart upon them board games and Dungeons and Dragons and video games and how we interact with the world. So uh, we also impart our love of, say, chicken nuggets and the, the foods that we like and the way that we speak, because we tend to have a very distinct accent. Uh, the cadence and rhythm of autistic and AUDHD speech is very different than the cadence and rhythm of neurotypical speech. And in doing all these things, we, we have this unspoken worldwide connection because, I mean, there's, there's autistic people in every culture, in every race, on every continent. And because I, I mentioned this a lot, that I guarantee you that the people who sign up for months and months and months of research in Antarctica are autistic because who <laughs> loves, who loves that much research more than an autistic person? So, uh, we, we have something that binds us and it's not uh, really tangible, but it's there and we can vibe and we can find each other, which is why I advocate for neurodiversity affirming evaluations, neurodiversity affirming therapy, because it helps us be more authentically ourselves. One of my own special interests is really related to those evaluations that you're mentioning and how we identify autism because our understanding of it has changed so much over time. Oh, yes. And so I would love to hear more about how you frame evaluations for autism in a non-pathologizing way, both in the educational and in the clinical settings. Like, how do we shift from the more traditional methods that are used for evaluation to something that is more affirming? Oh, man, are you in love? <laughs> so uh, I, I just finished uh, my participation in the summit at Learn, Play, Thrive. And our next project, I just turned in um, the first draft of my slides for our next project, teaching how to do uh, affirming evaluations. Oh, awesome. And we are going to do an entire continuing education credit course on this. And I, I think it's going to be fantastic because, again, this is the way that I do things. And I did an episode a while back about bad evaluations because mm. I, I work with a lot of people who have been denied a diagnosis for various reasons like making eye contact or driving a car or having a job or wearing makeup. Right. My own son, uh, my ex, uh, is not autistic. and My son is. And I, I recommended that he get an evaluation with one of my friends. And she said, no, they're biased. I will take him to this place. And she took him to this place and, oh, my God, it was a dehumanizing experience. Mm -hmm. And it was so frustrating that I, we made an entire episode about it. And we're, we'll be talking in the, uh, the course about it. There is this belief that uh, only young, white, cisgender boys have autism. And anybody else is automatically discredited. If you're an adult female or a trans person or a person of color, it's much harder to get a diagnosis. Uh, because of cultural factors, because of the way that it's presented. And you have to understand that uh, so far it's been very, very pathologized. Again, lack of eye contact, lack of social reciprocity, lack of theory of mind, all of these fascinating assumptions about us. And for instance, like uh, I do trainings a lot. And in one training, someone was unaware that we can biologically reproduce. <laughs> a doctor was unaware that we could biologically reproduce. And I was talking about my son, like, is he your biological son? I was like, yeah. Well, how, did, how was he created? And I was like, the old-fashioned way. <laughs> what, why do you ask? And, and had to explain that, yes, we, we have basic biological functions. Thanks for asking. This is the, the uh, assumption, because again, when my son was diagnosed, they made the assumption that because he, he kept telling the evaluator that I was there, so he wanted to go get a Happy Meal. 
because I always take him to get a six piece chicken nugget happy meal and a vanilla milkshake. <laughs> and the evaluator wrote in the report that he was fixated on the vanilla milkshake and did not have good social reciprocity with the evaluator instead of just asking, so tell me, why is this important to you? I want to know. It's fascinating and dehumanizing. And so oh, a big thing that I'll be talking about at the Learn, Play, Thrive Summit is uh, especially the approach to women. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there's this belief, uh, I, I can't remember who said it, but it was some evaluator. He made a big thing about how you have to, quote unquote, wear them down because women are natural maskers and you need at least 16 to 18 hours of testing to wear them down so you can see autistic traits. And this was his solution. I, I make the, have you ever heard the uh, parable of the sun and the wind? Mm -hmm. The sun and the wind uh, see this man walking down the street with a coat. And uh, the wind says, I bet I can make him take off the coat uh, faster than you. And the sun says, all right, you're on. So the wind blows really, really hard. And the man clutches his coat. And the wind makes it really, really cold. And the man clutches his coat even more. And the, the wind just blows and rains and hails. And then, you know, the man is just covered in his coat. And he's like, ah, oh, that's impossible. I can't do it. And then the sun says, all right, I'll get a shot. So the, war the sun becomes very warm and bright. And uh, the, the day becomes very nice and very sunny. And the man says, oh, wait, and just takes off his coat because it's warm and inviting. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about doing uh, an affirming evaluation, because when you're warm and inviting, and again, with my office and all the Pokemon and all the Mando and, you know, all the Star Wars, people see it and say, oh, you get it. You understand. Uh, like, uh, I was at a roundtable with uh, Dr. Devin Price of Unmasking Autism. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he noticed was the Hylian Shield. And he was like, oh, you're a Zelda fan. Like, I am. So we talked Zelda for, like, forever. Because he was like, oh, you get it. I'm like, yes, I get it. You get it. Oh, yes. And it's, it's this bond that is formed that makes people more willing to open up and more willing to talk about stuff. Instead of the trauma response, because masking is inherently a trauma response. Yeah. It's a survival mechanism because the world treats those who are different poorly. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you say you are safe with me, people are more likely to be themselves. And when they're themselves, then you can come at this from an affirming perspective. Because again, when people are secure, they're going to stim more. They're going to rock back and forth and sway, play with their hair and play with fidgets. And talk about the things that they love. And then we, we also talk about stuff that, because uh, again, you know, with the DSM diagnosis, it's technically accurate and it technically describes some of us, but it doesn't mention like interoceptive difficulties at all. Right. And we all have, you know, some level of interoception going on. Either we're very acutely aware and every rumbling makes us think that we're dying yes. or we might forget to eat, forget to sleep, forget to go to the bathroom and uh, have difficulty sleeping. And all of these things are endemic to being an autistic person that shapes our reality. So we, we talk about this kind of stuff and I use a lot of quotes because I'm echolalic and I think that quotes really uh, encapsulate a person's subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten some doozies over the years and they're fantastic. And then when we go over, because I always do a feedback session too, because I want people to know what I'm saying about them so that they can uh, affirm it, so that they can say, no, I don't want people to know that because I want them to be extraordinarily proud of their report. So we go over it and they're like, oh my God, I did say that. And I was like, yeah, it's perfect. And we talk about why that happened and how it happened and their love of you know having 40 guitars or My Little Pony or all of this stuff, and it's a celebration of being autistic. And uh, I, I use the term aut mitzvah because I'm like, <laughs> congratulations, you are autistic. And it's, it's a welcoming into this world in our community, in our culture, because they're not alone anymore. Yeah. They're not weird. They're not defective. They're just autistic and need to learn how to work through the world in autistic ways. I am not a patient person. And so when I see the the evaluations sometimes that come across my desk for some of my clients or um, people who've said things, you know, and they're like, well, so-and-so told me I can't be autistic or I can't be AD whatever it is, ADHD, whatever it might be, because X, Y, and Z. And it's like, I feel like sometimes I'm banging my head against the wall. How do we get practitioners 
to to see this. Oh, oh that's the thing. I mean, so uh, again, the number of people who are legally allowed to diagnose autism are surprisingly limited. Yeah. That only a few degrees and only a few professions are allowed, as opposed to licensed clinical social workers or so- somebody else who might have a better understanding of this. So so the the medical process in itself is incredibly ableist in that it's forcing you to undergo four years of socialization uh, where you have to socialize nonstop with people and you have to uh, engage in rotations and long hours without sleep. And it unintentionally creates a a bit of a bias Mm -hmm. against people who are not able to handle that rigorous uh, routine. But also, stuff like this is always referred by outsiders, uh, and uh, it's taught by outsiders. People who do not have ADHD, who do not have autism, who do not understand what it's like from the inside. So it's basically describing the experience of a bear when you've never been a bear. Uh, it, I, I use the analogy of a, a, a cis male gynecologist learning about what a period is because I'm sure that he's had the education about it, but he's never felt it before and therefore can't be as understanding as someone who has a uterus. That can be very, very frustrating. And especially, you know, when they say, oh, yes, uh, autistic ADHD people are somehow deficient as human beings or it's a fault of theirs that, the, you know, they're not successful and if they just buckled down and worked harder, because that's ADHD has always been classified as some sort of disorder of the will. Yeah. That you're just not trying hard enough. A moral failing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's insane. Uh, did you see the research where, okay, so uh, uh, do you know about the mTORs and the synaptic pruning? Yes. But go ahead and explain for folks. They were doing these studies and they found that autistic people. Uh, have a genetic immunity to this protein called MTOR, a mammalian target of rapamycin, which causes us to not weed out synapses, to not dissolve our brains through autophage, which means that our brains are hyperconnected and that that changes the way we interpret the world. And for the longest time, they assumed that ADHD was a dopamine regulation thing. Mm. But just back in, I believe, May or June, they published a paper that said, no, it turns out ADHD brains also ha- are hyperconnected. Mm-hmm. So ADHD and autism are far more connected than anybody ever thought. And it might be AUDHD is the standard, whereas you might uh, go in one way to be autistic and one way to be pure ADHD. But you know, there's so much overlap, ex- especially of traits and hyperfixation slash uh, monotropism. There's, there's so many things here that indicate that it's really two sides of the same thing. And mm-hmm. it's all linked to the hyperconnected brain. And again, when you try to, quote unquote, fix that or cure that, then you really deny someone's uh, inherent abilities and inherent biology because it's it's the way that we do things. Yeah. And it we really need to focus on helping a person be the best person they can be in whatever way they, they can, instead of trying to make people more neurotypical because that's never going to work. Special educators are the front line in our efforts to impact the lives of neurodivergent students, and good curriculum and programs are essential. If you're a special educator, join us at the Council for Exceptional Children Annual Convention and Expo, March 13th through 16th in San Antonio, Texas. You will find literally hundreds of sessions and professional development opportunities on topics special educators need to know about. And if you're a principal, you can attend free by registering with the code 24CEC100. New topic area strands this year include subjects like inclusive leadership at the building level and school mental health. You'll get tips and strategies you can actually take home and apply to supporting your students. Plus, it's a great chance to fulfill PD and CE requirements. Look for our podcast in the Expo Hall and check out the sessions I'm presenting while you're there. Again, principals get free registration by using the code 24CEC100. Find a link for more info and to register in the show notes. And we'll see you in San Antonio, March 13th through 16th at the Council for Exceptional Children Convention and Expo. You know, there's this piece of the autism evaluation that's related to how autistic individuals connect and communicate with others. Exactly. Kind of related to, you mentioned it briefly, but the theory of mind, quote unquote. Oh, yeah. Can you explain a little bit, first of all, what is theory of mind? Then also, I would love to hear, is this something that is useful? 
or not, what do we need to do with this whole concept of theory of mind? Oh, theory of mind. Okay, <laughs> so the theory of mind is, we'll, we'll talk about that in uh, Milton's double empathy problem with that. The theory of mind says that we are unable to take other people's perspectives. Because, again, historically, young white cisgender boys are the ones who were diagnosed with autism. And when a neurotypical evaluator asked, say, a four-year-old to take their perspective, a four-year-old might not be able to do that. But uh, it goes into stuff like the NEPSI. Mm -hmm. uh, the NEPSI has an extensive theory of mind section. And when I worked in community mental health and was doing autism evaluations, I would get in trouble for not doing it because I thought it was nonsense. Because, again, I'm autistic, but I was deeply in the neuro closet at the time. So the NEPSI involves tests like Bob and Julie go to the fair and Julie and Bob tells Julie that he will be at the tilt -a world. But instead of the tilt -a world, he goes to see, I don't know, the a dog. Where should Julie look for Bob? And the correct answer is the tilt -a world. But assuming that people are unable to take other people's perspectives, they would say a dog. Right. When, when I, you know, tested, you know, older kids and adults, they always got the question correct. And they, my, my supervisor would say, oh, Matt, they can't be autistic because they take other people's perspectives. And as an autistic person, I'm sitting here, you know, holding my head and trying not to scream. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a supervisor prior to her, uh, when I worked at a different agency, I came out as, uh, back in the day, I identified as Aspie before we knew about Asperger's and all that. Sure. Uh, so I was running an Aspie group for Aspie kids. And she said, how's things going? And I said, well, I'm, my Aspie group is going great. And language warning on this one because it's terrible. And if you don't find it terrible, then, you know, we may need to have some uh, a discussion. <laughs> so uh, she said, Matt, you can't say the word Aspie. And I was like, well, why not? I identify as Aspie. And she said, you can't be. That's like calling yourself, again, trigger warning, a retard. Mm. So my clinical supervisor, a psychologist, equated me with the R word. Yeah. And that was when I went deep into the closet. And, and later on, uh, there was a disagreement about something or other. And she said, Matt, well, I think that you have trouble seeing this. And I was like, well, I think that you think that I have trouble seeing this, but I think that you think that I think this. <laughs> going all meta <laughs> theory of mind. So this is the thing about, you know, like with Milton's double empathy problem, uh, the when doing research on autistic traits, if neurotypical researchers dehumanize autistic people and don't have empathy for autistic people, they believe that we don't have empathy for them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a matter of one of us being deficient, uh, perhaps willfully so. It's this cross neurotype communication mismatch where, you know, again, there's a lot of preconceived biases against autistic people, mm -hmm. and the the expectation is that we will live down to those. And if we don't, then we can't possibly be autistic because we are too, quote unquote, high functioning. Mm -hmm. No one ever, you know, asks about low functioning neurotypicals or high functioning neurotypicals. It's always, you know, neurodivergent people. And that's fascinating to me. Another area that I find myself constantly trying to navigate and understand as I, as I support my autistic clients is, is really helping them to balance the embracing of autistic identity, which I really feel like is important. Oh, yeah. Um, but also recognizing that there is some need in our world for some social adaptation. Yeah. How do you help your clients try to find that balance? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked because I've developed a therapy modality called Autistic Centered Therapy, AUCT. <laughs> it's basically four parts. One is autistic interpersonal therapy, and it's, it's basically helping an autistic person find themselves without masking, helping find who they are, find what they like, find how they relate to people in the easiest way. Because again, uh, there's a lot of people who encourage socialization with a very false notion of what socialization is, because again, it's reliant on scripting and inauthentic relationships, because I will say, you know, along lines, hi, how are you? I am fine. How are you? I am also fine. How is the weather? The weather is weather today. The weather is weather today. <laughs> and neurotypicals don't even like it, but they accept it as necessary somehow. But with us, you know, if you say, what's your favorite deep sea creature? You know, oh, the anglerfish. Oh, why about yours? <laughs> and we get weird with it right off the bat. And it's, it's much more engaging. Mm -hmm. So uh, part two of it is, an autistic advocacy work, not only for educating the, the, the people about what autism really is and who we really are, but advocating for oneself and 
part of that is the awareness that there are cultural differences from, you know, being in the autistic AUDHD culture and being in the neurotypical culture. And from that, we have to look at it from uh, like an anthropological perspective, because uh, let's say if you go to Greece, there's norms there. If you go to Iran, there's norms there. If you go to Germany, there's norms there. And you have to learn to adapt the whole eye contact. You have to adapt the cadence and rhythm of speech. You have to adapt the language that you're using, the clothes that you're wearing. But again, it's not a reflection of who you are. It's just you are entering the world around you and when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Mm -hmm. And when you approach it from like, you know, a, a cultural perspective of that, it makes masking for a few hours a day much easier because mm -hmm. you know that it's not some flaw. It's just uh, a temporary survival mechanism. Yeah. Not permanent. You can come home and take the mask off when you have a safe space, but it, it's, it's putting on the diving helmet and going out into the ocean you come back and then you can breathe the oxygen at home. One of my concerns sometimes is that I feel like, especially in the in the neurodiversity online world, that there really are people who believe neurodivergent people should never mask and they should never have to mask. How do you respond to that? In an ideal world, yes. Sure. Uh, I would love it if, if we could go out and be free to be ourselves. And this is another thing that goes into colonialism and racism and capitalism and all this other stuff, because I, as a cisgender, middle-aged white male, have much more freedom to be eccentric than other people do. Mm -hmm. And this is one reason why ABA specifically targets uh, black families, because they know that they know that there is a long history of police uh, unaliving autistic people. Mm -hmm. we, we recently had an incident in Kentucky where, uh, and again, trigger warning on this, uh, you may want to fast forward a few seconds, but where a, a, an autistic kid moved into a new neighborhood and he was investigating his house as any new kid would, uh, a neighbor said, oh, this kid is looking weird. And they called the police out there and uh, they, they shot him six times in the back for being weird. That this is the world that we live in, and it's incredibly unfortunate, and it's it's very hard, and we need a lot more social change to allow for eccentricity, to allow for differences, to allow for all of these things that we need to be uniquely human, uh, but it's not safe right now. Mm -hmm. I totally want people to unmask when it's safe, but I also want people to be safe to unmask. Right. And that's that's the big thing that we have to work on. And that's that's, again, why the Autistic Culture podcast is essentially PR for autism to try to get it out there that we are we are definitely, you know, human and that, you know, we, we might do things a little differently, but we are human and deserving of human freedoms. And uh, also in Kentucky. Uh, so so short disclaimer here. Uh, I am part of the Kentucky Advisory Council on Autism, mm. uh, but in this specific instance, I speak only for me. I do not speak for the council itself. Important disclaimer there, because again, uh, so there there is a bill that is being examined in the Kentucky Senate right now because an autism mom wants in-school ABA for her autistic child. And there was a big thing and it was on TV and all. And uh, so this senator who has ties to ABA wants to put ABA in every school and force every autistic child into ABA. We are against, oh, well, uh, I, I personally, I, Matt Lowry, not the council, for clarification purposes, and very much against that. So I'm, I'm spreading the word to let people know about this so that we can send letters to our state senators to, to send our displeasure with this, to say, no, we should have more neurodiversity affirming practices and help kids be safe instead of being conditioned to, you know, accept eight hours a day after school of intense behavioral conditioning rather than understanding who we are. Because yeah. whenever you try to change somebody, that's that's colonialism. That's well, There's a long history of indigenous people and people of color being forced into roles that, you know, to, because they were forced to fit into the mainstream. And when we understand people, we always win because it's just another beautiful part of the diversity of human experience. So yeah, it, it, the world is currently a dangerous place. And I think that effective temporary masking is an essential survival skill, but boy, that mask gets heavy. Yeah. Well, the way I always kind of frame it with my clients or when I'm doing trainings or whatever is talking about 
helping autistic people determine, like, what are the benefits versus the drawbacks of masking in any particular situation? Exactly. Is it worth the additional stress and energy that it takes for me to mask in this particular place? Or do I feel safe enough that I can self-advocate or, you know, go somewhere else? I mean, if I don't have to be in that. But it really requires some self-awareness. Yes. You have to feel safe enough on some way to advocate for yourself in one way or another. And and that can be really difficult, especially for people who have learned throughout their lives that their way of being is not okay. Yeah. So many people, and you you know this, uh, so many autistic people have CPTSD Mm -hmm. that neurotypical people have difficulty discerning what's CPTSD and what's autism. And that's the, another reason why they have so such difficulty identifying autism in adults, because if you've healed from your trauma, you may not have the distress traits that they are looking for. And the, the need to mask, the need to be safe is definitely a PTSD response from all the past trauma of the rejection of, you know, people attacking you. Mm-hmm. All of these details about, you know, being able to choose the mask. Oh, God, they're so important. Yeah. Aligning our lives with the way that our brains are wired is the constant challenge for neurodivergent people. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you just have a couple of ideas or some strategies that you found can be really helpful to help make sure that our lives are a good match for our neurological makeup. Oh, man. So there's so many components to that because there's there's our environment. Uh, I am fortunate enough to own a house, so I am able to... Uh, limit the amount of noise in my home. I have an air purifier to limit the amount of allergens. Uh, I, I organize my house in ways that work for me. I am able to, you know, make my world safe for me. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who don't have that luxury. I'm incredibly privileged in that regard. Uh, we also desperately need community. And we just recorded an episode about the TV show community. Mm, I love that show. Yes. Created by autistic Dan Harmon. And the history of how Abed became the protagonist. Yes. Because, you know, it, it's fantastic. But that's the thing. All humans need socialization. We, no human is an island. So we need to find safe people around us to let us know that it's safe to unmask. We need to find people who support us and love us. And that can be very, very difficult if you've been taught your entire life that you're broken or unlovable or strange or whatever. So that requires a lot of work. You need to have a a healthy diet. You need to have food. You need to have food that works for you and your digestive system. Because if you have IBS or a lot of food allergies or mast cell or POTS, which is common among us, you need to have the nutrition for your meat body to keep it going, which is actually part four of autistic centered therapy, Mm. meat body maintenance. (laughs) But uh, we need these things to keep us going and happy and energetic. There's so much that it comprises our world with like our sensory environment. If you need loops or other headphones to go out into the world, if you need blue lights, uh, sunglasses for your computer screen, if you need gloves or no socks, or uh, I'm coming to you from the comfort of my own home in a t-shirt, cotton shorts, and no pants. All right. uh, No, uh, no, I have pants. (laughs) Cotton shorts and no shoes. Sure. <laughs> Although, if you're listening to this pantsless, go for it. Well done. But yeah, I'm, I accommodate my environment uh, to meet my needs, but I recognize that that's a remarkable privilege mm-hmm. and not, not enough people have that privilege. There are autistic people who are so overwhelmed with the world that they're unable to keep jobs, that they're underpaid, that they're undervalued when they are paid, that they have difficulty leaving their parents' homes, that they might be homeless and crashing with friends. And when you have, it's the whole Maslow's hierarchy. If you can't meet your basic needs, you can't achieve the actualization. So uh, I recognize that I have a massive, massive, massive privilege in order to be able to do what I do because I am able to meet my needs. So uh, I, I, I really recommend finding a community to help you get your needs met. Mm -hmm. We live in a unique time where we are more isolated than ever. And that's incredibly tragic because, you know, centuries ago we, we lived in small hamlets and we had people around us. And, but at the same time, we were also miscategorized as changelings in the Fae because we were just awkward and invented wheels or fire were burned at the stake. So, (laughs) you know, as one does. (laughs) Yes. As one does. 
Oh, Matt, this has been such a great conversation. And honestly, I I would love to just chat with you all day, but this does bring us to our final question. Oh, yes. So as someone who is autistic and proud of your identity, but recognizes that there was a time when you were in the, quote, neuro closet, as you said. Oh, yes. When you look back on your evolution with understanding this, this part of yourself, what would you share with that younger version of yourself? What wisdom do you think you would have wanted to hear? What was the message that maybe would have been really powerful for you at that time? Uh, th- this may sound uh, like a cop-out, but uh, I would go with it gets better. Yeah. Because I, w- when I worked with autistic clients back in the day when I was in the closet, I would share with them that, you know, Yes, I am very much like you. I, I, I love movies. I memorize all the actors. I know all the voice actors and all the characters that they've been in. I created a Star Wars online encyclopedia with every character in it because I had to do it because this is the way. <laughs> and at the same time, I, I would say that, you know, the, the world is not safe, but it will get safer. Because, again, my personal journey, I was in the closet for many, many years until my son was born. And as soon as he came out, I, I realized that he was like me. He, he, he fixated on the ceiling lights and the fans. He loved fans. I knew he was like me. And I realized that I could not let him grow up in a world like the one that I grew up in. And that's when I became a rabid advocate. And I accidentally burned a lot of bridges because there were a lot of people who did not want an autistic therapist. Mm. There was a lot of people who did not want evaluations by an autistic person because they believed I was quote unquote biased. There was a lot of evolution in the few years after I came out. But on the other side of it, I found the most important people in my life. I found a fantastic support system. I found so many people that make my life not just bearable, but I wake up every morning happy and to tell my younger self that there would be a day that would come where I have this joy for life again. I, I would like to impart that upon him because it's it, it would be unthinkable back then to be where I am now. Yeah. Matt Lowry, host of the Autistic Culture Podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. The deaf community was the first community to insist on people using identity-first language when others referred to them. Being deaf was something that was part of who they were. It influenced how they communicated, their community, and their culture. Like the LGBTQIA community, reclaiming the term queer from the population using it as a term to other and as something that was less than, The neurodivergent community, and especially the autistic community, has reclaimed this part of themselves, allowing them to be unafraid and unashamed of what being autistic means to them. Being out of the neuro closet, as Matt described, is liberating. It gives permission to accept ourselves, advocate for our needs, and foster our community. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Someone don't help you When someone don't help you through the rain When feelings don't matter And everything's nothing but a game Game Just know that I'm with you Just know that I'm with you through it all And I'm gonna be there Whenever you win or if you fall Thanks to our sponsor, the Council for Exceptional Children, whose annual convention and expo is March 13th through 16th in San Antonio. You can find more info in the show notes. Also, thanks to Matt Lowry. If you'd like more information about his work or you'd like to find his podcast, it's called the Autistic Culture Podcast. You can find links in the show notes. 
I understand his podcast has a very loose dress code. Uh, I'm coming to you from the comfort of my own home in a t-shirt, cotton shorts, and no pants. All right, uh, no, uh, no, I have pants. Cotton shorts and no shoes. Sure. Although, if you're listening to this pantsless, go for it. Well done. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media director is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.